In this episode of STEMiverse, Marcus and I talk with Chris Johnson and Keith Burton. Both Chris and Keith are retired academics with a love for technology and education. They've teamed up to create large constructions using mechano blocks and Arduino-powered electronics. They take this hobby seriously, as you'll see later on. In this conversation, Chris and Keith discuss the mechano crane and explain how it represents a great way to introduce children to engineering and programming. Among other things, we also discuss the differential analyzer, robotics, artificial intelligence, and conversation boards, and the dangers of abstraction in education. This is STEMiverse, episode 4. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dalmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. Chris and Keith, thank you for coming to this very noisy cafe. We're going to spend the next about 40 minutes to drill you about your learning adventures uh, in making and uh, to extract hints for educators in STEM as well. So I'm here with Marcus, my co-host. So would you uh, we'll start, start with you, Chris. Would you like to take one minute and tell us about you um, what are you doing especially at the moment and a little bit about your background? Okay, at the moment um, I'm building a, a crane, a roboticized crane, which is going to be with Keith and he's going to do the electronics and I'm designing all the, ha- the hardware. It's based on a crane in Cockatoo Island that you can see if you want to go down and look at it. My background is uh, academia in IT. My research has been robots and AI, but I'm also a constructor with Meccano, I have part of a team, of which Keith is. We have a bridge in the UK, currently going to France for a big exhibition there that's seven metres long. 11 of us built it. The average age was 75, sorry, 74 with Keith. Uh, and I'm the youngest and Keith is the next youngest. Hey, Chris. Help me out there, Keith. <laughs> Chris, um, what is Meccano? Oh, Meccano is a construction toy um, dates from 1901. Um, It predates Lego and everything. It's similar to Lego, but it's based much more on engineering principles. In fact, you can say the British, um, the rise of British um, engineering innovation and um, the way engineering went through the whole of society um, in the first half of last century, or perhaps up to 1960, was based on Meccano, which has half-inch holes, um, and you have girders and strips and rods and lots and lots of gears, uh, and you can make the most amazing models with it. In fact, there's a theory that you, if, the, if you can make, if it exists in the real world, we can make a Meccano model of it. It's been a bit trickier since the advent of computers, but that's why Keith. Well, I've teamed up with Keith so that he can provide the specialised computer computing part. Um, and I can tell you, for instance, the sort of thing we're going to do with this crane just for fun. Um, Keith and I, you well, you won't notice, but if you were here, you'd see that we are about the same size. So we're going to set this crane up with a hat stand and the crane, Keith and I will stand in front of it, facing away, talking to our audience or talking to people. And the crane will pick up We'll both be wearing hats. It'll pick up my hat, put it on the hat stand, pick up Keith's hat, put it on my head, then go back to the hat stand and put the the hat on Keith's head. We'll also take our hats off and put them on the head stand. So we're going to do that as a bit of fun to show what you can do with Meccano. But the real purpose of it is for... Yeah, Keith's shaking his hand. He's he's the man that's got to do it. I'm just doing the engineering. He's got to do the programming. Um, But uh, we're really going to see... In 1938, there was a a huge Meccano crane um, called Gargantua, um, which was a fully roboticised crane that would build a model from a paper tape. Um, It was probably one of the most advanced pieces of machinery in the world at that time, quite honestly. I can talk about another one later on. Uh, Keith and I have got the instructions to build that. Unfortunately, the last man we gave it to to have a look at the instructions sadly had a stroke. Um, so we think it might be a bit hard for us. We're, we're doing this one as a bit of fun and to see 
how hard it will be, whether we'll decide then to go back and build the 1938 one. I think you should do it, but hey, Keith, what do you think about all that? You, you've got to do all the electronics, right? Well, <laughs> it's not as big a challenge as my, might be thought, but uh, uh, possibly my ambitions are a bit more limited than Chris's. It's uh, <laughs> simply a matter of combining the right lot of motors, microprocessors and sensors to make the thing work. Um, as for moving hats around, this is a matter of some debate as to how we'll achieve that, but um, it's uh, not what's, what's your background, Keith? My background? Um, well, initially the same as Chris's. I'm uh, originally an academic. Um, I originally trained in Manchester, which means I was trained by people who work with Turing, and one of my colleagues was the guy who designed the first Raspberry Pi, so I know a few people from back then, but um, uh, yeah, a few years in academia, a little bit of time in industry research with um, what was then Telstra, um, moved on to being um, head of communications at a university in charge of installing the internet when it was new. Um, this is UTS? No, this is at UNSW. Uh, Bigger and better. Since then, I've been a consultant. I spent a couple of years as a project manager for a national broadband network for the universities. And I've been sort of running down, doing a little bit of um, odd bit of teaching, mainly um, Unix system admin. And now I'm fully retired and building models. So uh, do you like it better now than back then at university? Oh, it's much better than working. Anything's better than working. Um, but yes, there's more time to get back into things that were, were fun. I, uh, I used to dabble in electronics when I was at school and when I was an undergraduate and uh, then taught it for a few years, but then really had to put it aside. So recently I've got involved with the Meccano, but I'm more interested in the automation. Current model I'm building until I get dragged into the, the crane is uh, simply a printing machine, but it's basically a Meccano mechanism that prints a wooden printing box, dabs them on a stamp pad and prints. Um, fairly simple Arduino processor, motors, sensors. Um, but a bit of a challenge with Meccano because it's, although it's a good engineering tool and it used to be a prototyping tool used in a lot of places up to maybe the 70s, it's, um, it's not exactly a precision engineering tool. So there's lots of clearances, there's lots of movement in the, the parts. But then again, there's an awful range of parts and there's an awful lot of expertise out there. Some of the early analog computers were designed, built out of Meccano, believe it or not. I have built one. Mm. I could get out like an analog computer. Yes, um, in 1935-36, uh, uh, Vannevar Bush in the States, I think it was Chicago, I might be wrong, came up with a thing called a differential analyzer. Um, one of the fellows who worked at Keith's uni, uni, but I can't think of his name, went over there for his um, postdoc, worked with um, Vannevar Bush and came back and about, uh, came, sorry, 30, came back to the UK and said, hey, this is the latest in computing, like today's if you go over and buy a, a, bit, a new microprocessor. Um, the 1930s, of course, were still, Britain was still suffering from the Depression, so money, of course, was a problem. And they said, fine, but we have no money. Uh, so this guy went away, got his Meccano set, or his son's, or his, it would have been his, actually, and built 90% of, um, of this um, particular differential analyzer. And the only bit he didn't was a particularly interesting piece of technology called the torque amplifier. That's not T-A-L-K, that's T-O-R-Q-U-E. Uh, oh, yeah. Which, if you think about it, means when you turn a little handle and it turns a gigantic crane or a gigantic thing, um, how is it amplifying the turning moment, which is really what talk is about. Um, I actually, there's a Meccano model. Um, I actually built that. Um, I have it at home. Uh, it actually works. It draws curves, and uh, which is quite amazing for mechanical parts to do an infinitely variable curve. Um, it has two torque amplifiers in it, which are just totally out of Meccano, which are incredibly interesting devices. Just as a matter of fact, this particular differential analyzer was used during the Second World War. There are about 20-odd of them built. 
Um, not m- many of them had actually Meccano parts because of their cheapness in universities, but there were some serious ones built. In fact, it was still used up to 1973 in New Zealand. They took one of the Meccano ones, and if you go and look on the web, you can go and see it in uh, New Zealand. Is this for artillery? Sorry? Is this for projectile artillery? Yes, exactly. To work out ballistics, of, of course, was the main one. Um, I've got some curves showing how the... Um, the uh, prince of uh, the hood was sunk, and um, it shows that you've got to work out the the angle of which the shell hits, the speed of which the shell hits, and then you've got to look at the thickness of the uh, of the metal, and you get one of those curves, not a parabola. What starts with H, not a hysteresis curve or uh, hyperbola, hyperbola. Um, and that, well, it's not a hyperbola, but it looks like it, which shows you how fast and what angle and what armour you can go through. And this was would have been developed by one of these differential analyzers. Of course, it was used for a lot more than that. But the interesting thing is if you've got to program it, you've got to understand mass, you've got to understand um, uh, how it mechanically works, and then you've got to put the whole lot together to work out how you use these mechanical um, gears and stuff to set up to make your program work. So it's a very, very interesting piece of machinery. So there's a few, uh, quite a, a few disciplines that come together to build one of your mechanical bridges, right? Or, of course, the differential engine is super complicated, but even something like what you're building, guys, the, the bridges and the, the moving parts, they do have a lot of... Um, calculations behind them and you know, planning ahead. Well, one of the good things about Meccano is that you, it becomes intuitive. Um, well, at least in my, in my opinion, that when you build enough with Meccano, for instance, this this um, crane that I'm building, I'm building all the structural stuff just from looking at the pictures mm-hmm. and saying, right, the relative dimensions, and then I figure out how to do it. Um, and I look at it, project management, one thing I did a lot at university, and if you like, Keith is my, Keith's my latest uh, um, uh, partner in project management. He did a lot of that too. Um, but it's the building the bridge was 11 old men. I thought I was the project. <laughs> yeah, the project. <laughs> um, so that it's, it's the matter of putting it all together. And Keith and I, as he said many times, we like being creative. So we, we like having problems. And Meccano allows you to do that. Um, but a lot of the engineering, there are some very sophisticated models. And if you build them or study them, you begin to work out intuitively, ah, I think I know how to build a good way of doing that. And I'm quite surprised just on looking at it, I can build gear trains and mechanisms which give me the right revolutions for what I want to do without doing any maths at all. Um, but that doesn't mean everything I do is correct. Did you use Meccano in your teaching when you are at university? Uh, no, no. Um, I actually, the story goes for most Meccano people, you, 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 you use it um, I was building, up to I was about 17, I was building some um, automatic gearboxes or self-selecting gearboxes, epicyclic gearboxes, interesting things. And then at 17, 18, as all men do, I discovered women, alcohol, drugs and music, and it was only in 2007. But I did use Lego to... too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I did use a bit of Lego um, because um, Lego came with a, a computing block um, and so I did get some of my students interested in doing some, some of the students built for an open day, they built a, an automatic um, noughts and cross player that people could play using Lego and the guys built it in about two days, which was pretty amazing. Um, the trouble is, is that uh, lots of academics are very theoretical um, and I think Keith and I, well, please myself, I'm very practical and I like mixing the theory with the practice. If you don't do the practical stuff, you can't do it so you don't see it. So, uh, you mentioned before that you're doing AI at university. Yeah. Like, which part of that big field were you doing? Oh, um, well, my interest is in um, uh, basically um, robotics, how to make a, you know, an autonomous thinking thinking. Um, uh, well, being, I suppose. Um, but I moved into doing a um, uh, Turing machine because I realised that... Um, what you is have the to... Turing machine? Oh, well, the tu- tu- not tu- well, the Turing machine is the basic computing way of doing computing. The, the Turing con- contest. Turing said that if you sit in a room and you talk to someone by, in those days, it was a teletype, basically an automatic typewriter, 
you would have to work out whether you were talking to a human being or whether you were talking to um, a, a computer. Um, it's a lot more sophisticated than that, and I don't think that was a good definition. I, in my research and thinking about this, if you're trying to work out whether you're talking to a man or a woman, and the person, how would you actually work work it out? Um, because, for instance, you probably have to ask something about um, women's reproduction to actually work it out, and. <laughs> Not necessarily would, I mean, you have to be a woman, I think, to ask that question to know whether a woman actually answered it. So I think the problem is much, much harder than that. But I actually ran lots of experiments. I had software, I ran them on open days where I'd have people and they would talk to a, my computer system and my, and a, a, what we call a confederate, a human player. And sometimes I get 80% of the people would pick my computer system as the, um, as the, the uh, human. Um, it learned all the time. So ended up talking to about 200 people and had about 40 or 50,000 sentences. And so if you taught it, spoke to it about something, you could reproduce that and use that. How, if did, it, how did you generate the sentences? Um, well, generating the sentences is a huge task. Um, I decided that most people learn most of their language. I had a couple of kids. I did lots of experience and kids and students. They just learn it by um, copying. You know, mimicry is one of the human's greatest forms yeah, especially, of... It. Especially if it's a swear word that's involved, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, what swear words, as I told my kids, they're adult words, so I could use them, but they couldn't. Uh, and I had to actually put that in my program so that um, it wouldn't swear unless you swore at it. And I had, a, had to put a switch in it when I ran open days with kids <laughs> that it wouldn't... Oh, it had a lot of swear words when it didn't work, I used to tell it. Um, and it, it would just um, repeat, or it would work out from what it had learned, what to, to respond with. I'd actually written quite a bit of software to actually generate sentences, um, but I never could, I never got far enough to work out how to do that. That was work in progress. Um, but just the learning stuff from what it had seemed to be pretty good. It, it, it... Chris, uh, what language did you use to write your AI? Uh, well, my original one was in Pascal because that was what I could use, but um, you don't really want to hear this, but I actually use Visual Basic. Um, the reason I use Visual Basic um, was because that when I'd done previous stuff, I needed to do a lot of database stuff. It was much easier to store stuff uh, in database. Um, because I wanted to know how it worked, everything at the inside the program was in English, so I'd use English. To, um, so that I could, if I wanted to see what was happening, I could understand. It's no point having XX1 and, you know, 372, what does that mean? Um, so um, I used it because of its database interface. And in fact, um, of course, one might say, well, it's not enough power, but I did it over many years and all I would do was wait for the, the next computer generation to come out, which would be up, you know, 10 times or Moore's Law, double every 18 months. Um, and so it worked perfectly well. I mean, speed, one has to remember that speed in human discourse is not like computers. They have to do millions of cycles per second. Um, for instance, my program would actually, to pass the Turing test, it would actually work out how long it would actually take to type the sentence and it would wait the appropriate time. If it had got a question where the yes or no answer, it would have some cogitation time. Sometimes it took longer than because it had to work it out, but if it sort of knew the answer, it would actually take time to do it because it was about the timing that was also part of the thing. If, you, if someone comes back immediately all the time, that's got to be a computer. So uh, I even wrote one that would make spelling mistakes and even uh, part of it I never used, but I wrote an algorithm which would you type something and it would make mistakes, double back, uh, correct itself, uh, and would type it the split one tenth of character, one tenth of a second. Um, Keith, I, I want to interrogate you now. <laughs> uh, do you do any teaching these days? Not these days, no. I'm... Any any uh, mentoring of you know uh, grand grandkids or nieces or? Um, not to my children, my. Uh... My daughter is frantically learning networking at the moment and uh, occasionally asks me questions but more often tells me things, so not... not she teaches you. <laughs> a little bit, yes. We are, um, both Chris and I and several other than the Carno team are doing a little bit of work with a girls' school um, who are in a robot competition and we're providing a little bit of mentoring for that. Um, 
probably we were bought in more for the mechanical ex- expertise and possibly the problems they're solving tend to be less complicated mechanical problems. So um, mainly we're there to make sure they don't saw their fingers off and things. But for all that, it's quite impressive the amount of um, things they do. We started off by showing the, the local, I guess, makers club at the school what Meccano was for. And it was quite impressive how quickly the girls would just pick up a box of Meccano and build a model. And whether we will follow up that when they've finished playing around with this robot, which is a, a bit of a pressure situation and taking all their time at the moment, I don't know. But it does give a basis for some of the mechanical concepts. From the point of view of building robots and so on, it's probably a bit more flexible than the sort of tools you can buy to build robots in that there's a much greater range of parts, but then it doesn't have the same precision. <clears throat> Oddly enough, the first one of the first things I ever built when I was a schoolboy was actually a little robot that ran around the floor controlled by um, old TTL logic gates with Meccano mechanics. And uh, it sort of developed from that. In fact, that was a fairly novel thing when I first started out. Most things were built using relays, um, old telephone technology. In fact, one of the um, one of the models I built. It's actually to see interesting to see how the control has evolved because the first Meccano model I made since I came back to the hobby about six seven years ago was a lift, about a metre high, four floors, with all the controls you get on a lift, you know, call up, call down. And I built a controller for it out of relays, which is about 70 odd relays. A couple of years later, I met a gentleman at a maker's show who was interested in um, process control. And he'd actually written his own programming language called Immediate C for controlling process and he said what I would love to do is control your lift with that so um, we had a long talk about this and I had to build a really rather complicated interface because the lift was all 12 volts incandescent bulbs and god knows what and he wanted to use a raspberry pi which was all 3.3 volts on low current so we I put together an interface and he now has a program written in his system that controls my lift. But I've I've never actually told him, so I hope he isn't going to listen to this, (laughs) that just to test my my interface, I built another controller using um, an Arduino micro and coded it in C++. So there's actually three controllers and indeed multiple generations of technology but still around the same Meccano model. So it's been an interesting experience. So what do you think the future is? I think we've just gone from relays to Arduino to to Raspberry Pi. It's very hard to know, but I think that in some ways the future might turn out to be quite depressing because I suspect that we'll probably end up with a plug and we'll just shout, make this lift work the way lifts work to some AI, um, probably run by Amazon or somebody like that, and we won't actually have much input. Well, to, to narrow down the question, maybe Marcus was asking about the future of education. So you can, <laughs> right? Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got an answer to that, but you go first, Keith. No, I'm just trying to get the context for education as in teaching STM? Well, STEM, yeah, you can, look, you can look at the tools of teaching. Well, uh, 50 years ago, it's just a blackboard, really, and pen and paper, and then things have moved along. Now we're talking about Raspberry Pis with four cores of processing and Internet of Things and all that, and Meccano, of course, and uh, robotics with that integrate AI in them, and all that is happening in elementary school. So. Fast forward 15, 20 years, what do you see happening in in teaching technology? Well, it's been an interesting experience just teaching technology in universities that over time we've become more and more abstract in what we've taught. Mm -hmm. We started off by telling people how to write machine code, how instruction sets worked, how registers worked. And now I've looked at the sort of things they're teaching in the first year computer science course. It's 
set up a web page to do something. HTML. HTML. <laughs> I wish and, that's what I did. <laughs> and, wow. Although, you know, we're getting further and further abstracted and people are just doing more things, and they're building that layered on all the tools that lie underneath that, you know, the HTML interpreters on top of the compilers, on top of the operating systems. But a small danger I'm seeing is that we're only teaching the top level now and less and less are we focusing on what's under that. And I think when you do that, you lose a sense of, for example, how to do things efficiently, what things are going to cost you in terms of equipment and performance, and also problems like security, because the security holes are at a level you're not considering. So I think maybe a little bit of an insight will come into the school system where we don't take start things at too high a level. Maybe we want people, at least when they're beginning, to understand what you can do with a basic microprocessor, with just a simple, you know, a flashing light on the end of a microsystem. Because then you can start explaining the levels. And when the kids of tomorrow are doing their IT jobs, which probably involve waving their hands at some sensor system to generate code practically intuitively, they will have an understanding of the implications of what they're doing. But a bit of a danger, I think, is that we'll only be teaching the top levels. And possibly in 20 years' time, we won't have anybody who knows how to build the lower levels. Or isn't STEM then also responsible for getting kids down to the lower levels of technology and producing technology literate people? I, I think it, in a sense, has to be because that's where it's going to happen. Um, and there is a sort of big responsibility in everybody involved is to not make it too easy. I mean, when you're 10, turning a light on with a program is impressive. And it's just as impressive as producing a picture on a web page, possibly more so, because you've no idea, you know, you can do that anytime by typing into Google. So I think, yeah, at the STEM level, we have to be careful we don't make it too easy, too abstract, too missing some of the basic principles, or we'll end up with a lot of people who can browse the web, but not necessarily build anything. So, okay, personal hobby horse, but I'll yes. push it. I actually actually totally agree with, with Keith. I think it's the abstraction that's going to be our undoing. Um, if you look at um, how we've got levels on levels, I look at what they teach in um, my last years of university about the web. And, you know, you read comments like, oh, I wrote this program, but I copied everything by just <laughs> looking at lines of code off the thing. I have no idea how it works. Yeah. And plugging in modules. And I really actually think that that's what's going to go. People are basically lazy. You know, if you can push a button and do everything for you, you do it. Now, of course, you're going to have the, the hobbyists and the things like Keith. I mean, I, my first project was to Meccano and electronics was build a wah-wah pedal. So I had the, the pedal out of Meccano and I built the electronic circuit board. Um, I actually built a processor, a four-bit processor that's clock cycle was as fast as I could do it, and I built all the components, and that's given me a really inside look at computing. But does anybody need to know it? And I agree with Keith, we do need to look at the basics, but so they get interested in 10 years old, who's going to do it at 12, at 14 or 16? We used to teach operating systems, and we dropped it about um, early 2000s. We don't teach operating systems now. There are lots of problems that operating systems cause, and we can say, oh, yeah, but the machines are faster and they'll have more memory, so these problems will sort of go away. But I don't think necessarily they will, although they'll, they'll go away till they come back and really bite you with a big bite. Um, but you've still got to have the people that are going to fix these or to improve them or to sort out, as Keith said, security is a major issue because they're so complex these days. Um, And I'm not really sure that, I mean, we may get ourselves a level of abstraction that it's built by computer programs that, that you know, design all the chips and it, all the software's written years ago. I mean, I read an interesting book um, 
sci-fi book sent about, I don't know, 200,000 years in the, in the future. And it was very obvious that when they were talking about it, that the protocol they were using at the bottom was IP4, which is the, the or IP6, the book IP6 wasn't there. But it was, in his, the way he was writing it was this had been around for so long. Now, um, you say, well, we've got the world, we've got IP4, we're trying to turn it into IP6. But the point is, um, we're always going to have IP4 or the equivalent of because it's too big a system to change. Um, now, you know, you can say, oh, well, you know, we've said that about many things in the past. Um, I've just read this interesting book about te- telegraphy and the impact of the, um, the, the telegraph system. Uh, it's called the Victorian Internet, and it's an exact... You, you read it and you see parallels... You see parallels of what's happening today and the future. Um, but... Um, as Keith said, I mean, if we get robots that do stuff, um, you know, what's going to be the need for education? I mean, I think we're going to have to look at the fact is that um, we're going to get... The only way we'll survive a society is have a basic income. Everybody gets a basic income. If you want to work on top of that, good luck to you. But I think that you're still going to get the hobbyists and the... I mean, the, the scientists in the old days that would sit in their mansions and build stuff, right? I mean... Um, what kind of outlet, what they're going to come up with, I don't know. But I do think that there's a big gap. Yes, we can teach the basics, but then you try to explain to students. My son's doing um, an IT course and he was talking about um, a system that he had at work and he just didn't understand the operating systems and the, the way that this was causing all sorts of issues. And even explaining it to him was a bit difficult. It was almost like I was talking to him about a steam engine. Um, and I gave him a whole lot of references on the web, um, but whether he looked that up, I don't know. Um, and the thing is, that information is in the web, but it's like when you go to a web page and every third word you've got to go and say, oh, what's that mean and what's that mean? Now, for those that want to do it, that's great. For most people, they're going to give up. So I think this level of abstraction keeps going going on, and I really agree with it, that we may get to the dangerous spot where we actually don't know. An example of that is that the one of the British museums had a Burroughs 5500 machine that they had, and they wanted to get it working for the public about, oh, about 10 years ago. They had to go and find the old guy, or the older guys that had programmed it and worked and operated because that knowledge didn't exist. And if you've ever read a manual, it wasn't, you know, to do the manual would be two years of making mistakes before you actually understood what the manual did because all the terms and references and implied references were to historical stuff, not stuff today. All that reminds me of the priesthood, say, in ancient Egypt, where the deep knowledge about how the world works, like geometry back then and all mathematics, it was held by a few people in the pyramid And everybody else just believed what the priest said, right? So are we going back to that? Because all that, like, knowledge of how the IP v4, v6 works, uh, is the students never get to learn it because of the abstraction level above it. So. I'm not. Um, I'm not sure that we're the priesthood anymore. Now it's more like being the the witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we 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 understand arcane things, but there's a. There's a bit of a tendency in the world to, to burn the witches now. That is, the, the scientists, the technologists aren't necessarily seen as as being a good thing in in abstract. Especially and I think that's changes. Well, yeah. And I think that's part of what's driving people away from doing let's say, technology. Let's say that you are powerful. Yeah. One comment on that. Yeah. I think that as you guys, for the audience, these guys are much younger than Keith and I. Um, that when our generation, the baby boomers, die, die uh, which is about 20, 25 years, most of us are going to be dead, um, that's a big chunk of the population proportionate to the age group, that a lot of knowledge and things are going to get disappear. And what happens then is going to be very, very different. I'll give you a little story which only occurred to me. I belong to a railway, um, the Hornby Railway Collectors Association. I'm interested in trains, always have been. And it always struck me why people would go and watch trains at the ends of stations, right? My father did it and I couldn't ever get an explanation. Lots of people, this real admiration for steam engines, you know, because they're dirty, you know, I mean, smoky. And they're smoky, they're, they're old technology. You don't actually need a lot of skill to actually drive them. Um, and I sat down and thought, 
1880s, if I, or 1850s, I was in a field and all I'd ever had was horses or the strength of the big guy in town to move stuff. And I see this engine going past, maybe only doing 30 miles an hour, well, 30 kilometres an hour, towing half a dozen carriages full of whatever. That is an enormously powerful thing. It is far more powerful than anything else we've ever seen. And so there was this worship of the train engine, which we're just dying out now, because these guys are about 20 years older than us. So a lot of this stuff, that these attitudes that Keith has and I have, will disappear in 25 years. There will be no one to carry those flags and everybody else will be just used to doing the abstraction. There won't be very many older people that, you know, well, let's say when Keith gets old, people can go and talk to him about working with, with Turing. That, that link is going to disappear, right? Um, and so I think that's going to be another issue that when the baby boomers do, the changes are going to be quite traumatic for a long while because yeah. knowledge will have suddenly disappeared forever. And that's the problem. So maybe teaching STEM is not just not to, in order to produce better thinking individuals in the future, um, more technology, literate, et cetera, et cetera, but also as a responsibility to teaching people the, uh, well, teaching people how to build things from scratch, right? From the bottom layer. It's something that you can't really get in software anymore, right? We use tools in software and libraries and all that stuff that are abstraction layers. But when you're working with physical things, like when you're building a robot to go to a competition to you know, beat other robots up, you actually have to, to work at the level, level of the rivet and the motor and the wire and the motor control and all that. So very, very low down to the bottom. Except there's one good point is that STEM, if you do this stuff practically, it really enhances creativity. That's the one thing that you get as a bonus. People can be quite creative. Okay, I may be building a, a little thing that runs around and lights a light, but I thought of the idea and I was able to do it. I didn't just go buy a Lego kit and build it up. Oh, look, it does all that. I actually had to think of it. So I think that um, relating STEM to creativity is probably the, the best thing we can do because it does allow, well, it provides the option and allows much more creativity. Because it's very hard, unless you're doing art, to be creative, and most no pictures have been painted anyway, you know. Even photography, nearly every photo in the world has been taken. You can't go and, I mean, look at music. You, you talk to young people and you walk in and they're playing all the music from the, the 70s and the 60s, 70s, the 80s, and you say, why are you listening to that? Why aren't you listening to modern music? And they say, because this is much better. It's much more interesting, you know, because all the original, there's only so many tunes you can do mathematically that sound good. They've been done and it's hard to come up with things that are new. And I think that the, the STEM stuff is your is way of keeping creativity alive. That would be that would be yeah. my message. So if you were a benevolent benevolent dictator, <laughs> how would you structure the teaching of technology from you know year one all through to university? How would you a lay couple, that? Out? A couple of elements, I suppose. So the main elements that would drive the main elements that should that would drive the teaching of STEM in schools from early on. That's a really hard question. Um, I think that my way of doing it, which I think, like Keith said, reflects my own personal thing, is I would get a lot of input from the students uh, going through and as they came out the other end and I would keep feeding that back in, that I think the only way to keep it alive is you have an older person teaching, doing it, yes, to do it, but you need to have a, a large component of the, the, the young people saying, this is what interests us, this is what we're doing, because, you know, the joke about any, any teacher, any academic, any teacher, is every year the students get a year younger, <laughs> all right? And it's quite surprising how divorced you can get um, from um, different generations. You might think that you're cool and you're hip and all of that, but you really aren't, as much as you think you are. Uh, and I've, I've done some, exp um, I did a lecture and they were going to teach um, overseas students English to do, come to Australia back about 2000. And the woman wanted to sit in my first year lecture and look at the language I used. And I said, fine, just give me the words and things and an opinion. And what? So she gave me this list of words that I just used thinking my students understood it. I mean, it was 19, I was 48, so 50, 48, 2000. I quickly went back to my office, photocopied that list off, gave about 10 copies to my five or eight tutors, said, just pick people at random, get them to define the meanings of these words. No one got 100%, most people got less than 25%. And these were phrases and words 
went from erudite, I used cruising for a bruising. That just went over their heads. I thought that would be obvious. Uh, and lots of other terms which I thought were obvious. So I think that you really got to get this um, loop in and you've got to respect what they say. You mightn't agree with it, but you have to respect what the younger people, and also as they come out and they become older, bring them back in and just have this continual, continual loop. That's my opinion. I'd like to ask you a few rapid fire questions that are very practical in nature and um, we can use them as, as advice or resources for our listeners. So for example, would you recommend one or say up to three books that the listeners of this podcast must read? I think Chris can do that. I don't tend to look at books. It's Chris, any ideas of books? Um, if you want to do STEM, you need to get a subscription to New Scientist. It's $5 a week, $5.50, $2.50 bucks buys you a year, subscription comes every week. It doesn't matter what you're interested in, nothing is longer than three pages. There is that you can understand sciences. I, I've been a reader of it for 40 years. Keith's been a reader of it for 40 years. I'll give you a little story. When my sister was um, 16, she went to a school counsellor um, to see what her career would be. They said that the family should buy new scientists for her, which they did. She then became head, she's just retired, head of the Thermo Protection um, uh, Division of NASA. Wow. Right, she's oh. just she's just president, just been elected president of the American uh, Ceramic Engineers Society. Yeah. So that's how good New Scientist is. It continually keeps up to date, um, and there's things. And as young people get more and more educated, or they read it because it does educate you, they can uh, understand. For instance, I read it during the time when they looked, discovered quarks, charmed quarks, up quarks, coloured quarks. I sort of have a really good understanding of how that works because every couple of months there'd be a new article and they'd go back and cover the stuff. And so it was like an unravelling, you know, fiction story, except that it was real. Yeah. I bought my subscription yesterday for the kids you know, after, after I spoke to you. <laughs> Any other books? I'm not sure STM books as such are that common. There's plenty of reference material, but then there's a lot of reference material on the internet. It's actually hard to sit and read a book mm. and learn anything about STM. It's, if I had any advice for people teaching, I'd say be aware of the fact that people now like immediate satisfaction. Don't teach, give them things to do and get them to do something that they can finish quickly. And in year one, if they can get a book to light up in the first 20 minutes, that's good. And by, you know, five years later, they might be prepared to spend three weeks on a project and look through reference material. So build that capacity to build up a time. Exactly. For more and more and more complicated projects. But the whole thing about STEM is what makes it interesting, what makes it stimulating, is things happen. It's not like history. You can't do history. You can do. Assassinate Trump. That'd make history. But, um, oh, I can't put that on. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the other thing I, I, I would say is that the history of inventions are quite interesting. There's a very good book, for instance, by Longitude, by Dava Seville, which tells you how they worked out to build a clock that would, no matter what the ship does, um, would still keep time. In fact, there's Meccano models of it. You can build it. It's my goal to build it one day and take it on a boat. Um, and the creativity, I've just read one, um, The Victorian Internet by Tom Standage. And again, really interesting because it's the parallels. So I would say that if the teachers were to say, find some books and said, okay, it's not English, but I want you guys to all go and buy and read this book or maybe a dozen books and three or four people and then get up in the class and said, okay, what did you get out of that? What creativity? What is it that they said there which is still true today even though the technology is different? Because I got my, um, my uh, desire or absolute focus on, on STEM. I had these golden books of engineering which had all of the famous, every engineering thing from the 30s or 40s, um, pictures of it and a description. And I had engineering books written for young adults. And I would read those and reread that. And then I had the Meccano, so I would see this and I could do it practical. So if you have this stuff and then take Keith's idea, where they're doing some of the things. So um, if they look at some of these um, uh, 
books, they may be able to teach you, maybe to turn, okay, right, we're going to make some projects, simple parts of those ideas, which they can build and say, well, gee, it is actually quite hard to make to do this, or yes, it's a lot easier today with today's technology. So I think relating those two, because the history gives it a depth. You know, engineering didn't appear. I mean, one of the reasons they say Meccano's gone out of date is you go and look at an old bridge or an old thing and you can see the gears and all the things. You look at anything modern, it's all in boxes. You don't know what's happening. And so when you saw it, I could read this book, go down and see it and be inspired. So I think the same principle would, would work really well. But I really agree with Keith's thing that the practicality is the most important thing. And, and to give them lots of scope to be, not only just do it, but what else could you do with it? You know, so if they light a light, um, Maybe they can make one that lights it, you know, or press a button, whichever one goes first or something. Give the kids some creativity. Oh, I've got to ask, favourite programming language? <laughs> of course. It's uh, Marcus' a standard question. Your uh, favourite programming language? C++. <laughs> Real programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Engineer. That, that's what it says. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, one of the problems I have is that every new language that I have to learn over the years um, I get frustrated because um, I could do all this stuff in all the languages and now I've sort of, I forget to put the full stop in, is my favourite saying. Um, it, to be honest, I really enjoyed COBOL. I, I wrote some fantastic stuff, transaction <laughs> pro processes, online editors and COBOL. Fantastic, because I could make other people read it. I really enjoyed Pascal as an early programming language. It gave me the freedom to what I did. I chose Visual Basic. Yes, it annoys me sometimes, but I didn't have to think. I could do it. I, I tried to teach myself um, C Sharp, which to me seemed to be a pretty good answer to just about everything I wanted to do. I just needed some guru to sit next to me for three weeks so I didn't throw the computer out the window because I just ran into how do I get this Hello World program to work, which is a, a doddle. Um, and the other thing, of course, it depends on the programming language. I'm a, I like designing big systems, complex systems. Um, there's a learning a language and then there's being able to design in that language and think about how to structure a problem and how to, as Keith would say, get efficiency or resources or just how to structure it so you can write it or, or produce it and test that it works and things like that. So um, that I think is a big difference between a language uh, and that, for instance, I'm probably going to go and try and teach myself C++ uh, with Keith. I've been thinking about it. I'll get him to give me an, I'll buy an Arduino. I'll get all his code and then I'll start modifying it and then I might be able to do it. Because you can see, I can think of things like moving hats with a crane. I get quite creative. But actually writing the programming for the Arduino, that's going to be Keith's business. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> well, Keith and uh, Chris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And unfortunately, uh, I could easily spend at least another hour talking to you. So I would probably, uh, I think we'll invite you again to do Our part pleasure. two. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to find a, a little bit more quiet place to do part two, but uh, we'll figure something out. So thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you. Good luck, guys. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E -E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>